Well, hello there, everyone. Mr. Porter here again. Uh, we're uh, going to uh, go over uh, for uh, today, uh, this would be Wednesday, uh, the uh, vocabulary for uh, Unit 2.4. And uh, you'll, uh, you'll be uh, happy to know that uh, uh, this, uh, <laughs> yeah, real happy, uh, th this vocabulary is is uh, essentially on uh, two sides. Uh, it's a double-sided uh, sheet. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff on here. Now let's get started on the first one, and and I think I've mentioned it already with the supremacy clause. It's actually part of Article Six uh, in the uh, Constitution, uh, where it talks about uh, uh, that that the U.S. Constitution and the uh, the uh, laws from the federal government are supreme to the constitutions and the laws of the states. Uh, and that's essentially where it, uh, where it's, it gets that. Uh, on Friday, we will find out about judicial review. And one of the cases that, that was decided, uh, one of the first cases in judicial review, will talk uh, about uh, that. Essentially, that was the decision of the court uh, telling the states, "Hey, knock it off." Uh, the the uh, the the uh, the states are in no no uh, uncertain terms uh, below that of of the federal government. Uh, that uh, the constitution and the laws of the federal government are supreme or superior to those of the states. Um. Popular sovereignty is a term that we haven't talked about uh, yet, and this will be very, very crucial, learning about popular sovereignty, because when we get into the Western migration of, of settlers moving westward, uh, we're going to hear about popular sovereignty being used, uh, especially when it came to deciding whether they would have slavery in those new territories. And uh, the popular sovereignty was used uh, to allow the settlers, uh, I guess, make the decision for themselves whether they would have slavery in their, uh, in their new territories or not. Uh, and by popular sovereignty, I mean by the ballot box. Okay, They would vote whether they would have slavery or not. And we will find out that there is... Um, uh, uh, I've already mentioned before that there were three main uh, main compromises uh, from 1820 to 1854, and uh, it seems like uh, well, two of them anyway uh, had uh, uh, had uh, dealt with popular sovereignty in some of the territories. So when we get to that point uh, in talking about the 1800s, uh, we will really talk about po uh, popular sovereignty a lot. But it's the people deciding whether they would uh, have slavery in their territories or not. Uh, we've already talked about uh, the delegated, the concurrent, and the reserve powers. We talked about that on Monday where the delegated powers or the enumerated powers are those that are actually mentioned in the Constitution uh, for the federal government. Uh, the concurrent power, well, actually, we'll talk about the reserve powers first. Uh, that has to do with the Tenth Amendment uh, and uh, everything that is not specifically mentioned for the federal government. Those powers are reserved for the states uh, and the people. Uh, very, very important that you understand not only is it for the states, but it is for the people as well. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the uh, concurrent powers, that's where the federal government and the state governments uh, have uh, things in common where they're able to do the same things, okay? And uh, we mentioned that taxation is one of those things uh, that would be uh, mentioned as a concurrent power, uh, taxation. Uh, the federal government uh, taxes things. The state government taxes things. 
Uh, and I, I even mentioned, I believe, on Monday about the counties. Uh, and um, uh, the counties also have a taxation uh, available to them. Usually it's, it's through property taxes. Uh, so just remember that. Uh, one thing that uh, I said we were going to be talking about uh, as well is the Electoral College. And we've already had a glimpse of that, I believe, in uh, the Khan video, the Khan Academy video that we had uh, that talked about uh, uh, the uh, compromises in the the Constitutional Convention, which it was. Uh, it it uh, you know the 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 larger states wanted to have a direct election or a popular vote election uh, for the uh, for the president, but there were certain people uh, certain people who I don't want to say were uh, stronger willed, but uh, uh, that's probably the the best way to describe it. Uh, that said, if we do that, we will subject ourselves to. Uh, to the the rule of of the of the majority, uh, and we would tend to look at ourselves as a democracy, and they did not want to be a democracy uh, because the rights of the minority would be trampled upon. Uh, whenever you have a democracy, the majority rules. And it's too bad for the people that are in the minority. So that 49.9%, uh, it's too bad. <laughs> You're uh, subject to the whims of the 50.1%. Uh, and that's not a really good way to go in my book. Uh, and I think you probably think the same way. Uh, and so uh, it, uh, you know, obviously we are not a, a, a democracy, uh, but... Uh, uh, you know, the Electoral College was set up so that uh, the small states would not be beholden to the large states. Uh, case in point was the, the election in 2016, where Donald Trump was elected president. Uh, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. But the reason she won the popular vote was because she had, uh, uh, she had won a huge margin of victory in California, I mean, we're talking three or four million, uh, and and also in New York, she won by a couple of million. Now you add those together, and that's about a six million vote difference. Well, she only beat uh, in the popular vote. She only beat uh, uh, Trump by uh, like a million and a half, two million votes. So uh, you know that sort of skewed things a little bit. The rest of the country voted uh, essentially with Trump. And that's why he won the electoral college. A lot, in fact, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, the smaller states like Iowa, uh, Nebraska, uh, some of them uh, went as far as almost two thirds for Trump. But they don't have the population that a California or a New York would have. So it's something to think about when the founders put that together. Uh, the the electoral college they thought that it would be better for uh, I guess uh, the uh, upstanding men uh, who would be serving as electors uh, to decide uh, 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 for for the the people uh, I guess the, <laughs> the the word I heard mentioned was rabble uh, but uh, you know Honestly, in uh, honestly, in uh, uh, in modern times, uh, each uh, in each state, you have two sets of electors, usually for the the uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, uh, and whoever wins the uh, the. Uh, uh, the margin of victory. Margin of victory ha only has to be uh, one tenth of one percent uh, or less, um, and uh, uh, a person could win with fifty point one percent of the vote, but they get all of the electoral votes uh, for for that particular state, and that's that's true. That that is how it works. But 
usually it's not that close. Uh, usually uh, it'll be uh, three, four, five percent uh, difference, uh, usually uh, in the states. And so the electors will go to that individual. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, what, uh, what we might do is, is maybe on, uh, tomorrow, uh, on Thursday, uh, when I'm back, uh, that we'll go over the Electoral College and I'll f explain it a little a little fuller to you. Uh, judicial review is something that we're going to find about on find out about on Friday. It's where the the actual judiciary, in this case, it's the Supreme Court, uh, gets to decide whether uh, laws passed by Congress or executive orders by the president are constitutional, whether they pass constitutional muster, uh, and we'll find out that. There were some cases uh, that were actually decided by the Supreme Court under the Chief Justice John Marshall uh, that uh, decided for uh, uh, for the judicial review and the opportunity for the Supreme Court to decide things uh, to actually have a to to uh, give some teeth uh, to their check uh, over. Over not only the the executive but also the, the legislative branch. Uh, something else that's happened uh, quite recently, um, and that would be impeachment. Uh, the House of Representatives actually are the ones that draft the articles of impeachment, uh, and that can be not only against the president; it can be against a vice president. It can be against a uh, a member of the uh, the president's cabinet. Uh, it can, uh, I believe, they can uh, actually impeach a Supreme Court justice as well. But uh, I'd have to think. I'd have to look uh, at uh, actually at at uh, at uh, Article uh, Article One to find out if they're actually able to do that. Uh, I'm not certain on that, but they can uh, they can impeach. Uh, 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 offer articles of impeachment against a sitting president. The first time that happened was with Andrew Johnson. Uh, he took office when uh, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. Uh, he was uh, Lincoln's vice president. A lot of people in Congress didn't like him because he was from Tennessee, or uh, as somebody I heard say it, Tennessee. Um, and he... Uh, uh, you know, Tennessee was part of the Confederacy, yet he was elected to the Senate. He served in the Senate uh, in Washington, uh, weirdly enough. Um, but uh, he was chosen as vice president, and of course he became president with the death of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, supposedly he he broke a law that Congress had, had put in place called the Tenure in Office Act. Uh, in other words, when... When he was to fire anyone, uh, anyone in his uh, in in his cabinet, he had to tell Congress first, uh, and then fire the person. You know, uh, like the person wouldn't find out then that they're being fired. Hello. Um, well, uh, he ended up firing. I believe it was his uh, his Secretary of War. Uh, that's the same as the Secretary of Defense now. Um, it changed uh, after 19, uh, after World War II, let's say, uh, from the de from the from the Department of War to the Department of Defense. Um, and he didn't tell Congress about it, uh, and <laughs> so he got into trouble. Uh, and they did articles of impeachment against him, and they almost uh, convicted him in the Senate one vote shy of convicting him in the Senate and removing him from office. The person that cast that lone vote, that last vote, said, I will not be a party to this. And uh, uh, he essentially equated it with a lynch mob. And uh, uh, they, uh, he uh, kept, his, kept his position as president, but he's pretty much a lame duck president after that. Uh, the next time... Uh, almost happened well actually it did happen well actually with Richard Nixon it was about to happen let's put it that way um, actually uh, Richard Nixon 
uh, was, he would have been impeached, and if he had been impeached, he would have been removed from office uh, because he did break the law. He committed a felony, uh, and uh, that was essentially uh, by conspiring to cover up uh, what happened with the, the Watergate break-in. And we'll, when we get into uh, more current type history down the road in the in second in second quarter uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Watergate break-in um, but he should have been uh, but he resigned should have been impeached but he resigned before that could happen uh, for what he said was the good of the country uh, another uh, time was uh, Bill Clinton Bill Clinton lied under oath which is a felony in every state and the United States uh, yet he uh, was not put on trial. Uh, he was never charged in a court of law. Uh, he was uh, impeached in the House of Representatives, uh, but he had too much backing in the Senate uh, to, uh, to actually uh, come away being removed from office. Uh, and that was pretty much during his second, uh, second term, so he was a lame duck anyway. Uh, and then the the the, uh, the last two times were both Donald Trump. Uh, he was impeached by a very strongly uh, a, a heavily uh, Democratic vote. In fact, it was uh, all Democrats. Uh, they had the majority at that time uh, that voted to have him impeached, uh, and it went to the Senate where. You need a two-thirds majority, and all of the Republicans voted to exonerate him, and all of the Democrats voted to convict him. Go figure. Uh, and that happened both times. Uh, uh, just some real petty stuff, and, uh, uh, as, and uh, one of the times was about the January... Uh, well, actually, no, it was prior to that, but uh, uh, they're looking at, they're doing an investigation of the January 6th committee. Uh, uh, one of the nemesis, a lot of the people uh, uh, involved with the January 6th committee were also involved with trying him in the Senate uh, for his two times of being being uh, uh, being impeached. So this could be interesting. Uh, the veto veto is the power of the president to uh, override a law that's been passed by the uh, by the Congress. Uh, you know, Congress can say, yeah, we want this. You know, the, the House of Representatives says, yeah, this is great. The Senate says, yeah, this is great. And they both pass it. They send it over to the president. The president says, no, this isn't great. And they put the stamp on that. They say, veto it. He signs it, sends it back to the House of Representatives and the Senate. And they have to have a two-thirds majority uh, to override the veto. And... That's not going to happen in the next while. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you that right now because we're we're uh, we're we're on ma razor thin margins uh, for those who have the majority in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. Razor thin majorities. Uh, you have uh, 51 Democrats in the Senate right now. Prior to this election coming up. Uh, 49 Republicans, razor thin. And then you've got, uh, I think the uh, Republicans have the the uh, the uh, majority in the House, but only by like 15 uh, out, of, uh, out of 435. So just razor thin margins. So vetoes are not going to be overridden for a long time, long time. Uh, federalism, we've talked about that already. We talked about that on Monday, that that's uh, controlled essentially. Uh, it's a federal government sharing power with, with the state governments. Uh, Republicanism. Now, on here, it's a capital R, but don't, don't take that wrong. It's not actually a, a, a capital R. The, the only reason is, is because it's, it's the first word. Uh, it's supposed to be a small r. Republicanism is a system of government where, where uh, or a republic, right? Where we get that republic from, uh, where uh, the people actually uh, elect uh, elect representatives to represent them, and usually it's 
design districts and, and that sort of thing. Um, the uh, limited government, uh, that's what the anti-federalists were, were all big about because they did not want a central government that was too powerful. They wanted the, the central government limited. Uh, democracy, you know, uh, the last one really was probably up uh, in uh, New England with, uh, with the Massachusetts Bay Colony with their town meetings where each family got one vote. Okay, that's probably the last one. The last one before that was uh, probably ancient Greece. Uh, and not everybody got to uh, participate with ancient Greece. It was only uh, property owners and men. Uh, so sort of like the, uh, the people who were casting votes uh, in uh, the United States uh, at, the be at the beginning of the Republic, right? It was landowning white men uh, who got to vote. Uh, we've talked about the separation of powers uh, and the checks and balances. You know, that's, that's Baron de Montesquieu, right? Uh, the three branches of government, uh, the separation of the powers so that no one branch of government would, uh, would be more powerful than the other. Uh, and also the checks and the balances. We've talked about that with the president having the veto power over Congress, Congress able to override the veto, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, we've talked about the three branches. Uh, you just need to remember this. The legislative branch is Article One of the Constitution. The executive branch is Article Two of the Constitution. And the judicial branch is Article Three of the Constitution. All right. Now that's enough for... Uh, uh, for our vocabulary. Now, uh, uh, something that you're going to have, uh, you know, uh, this, I told you this was going to be a, a rather long, uh, rather lengthy uh, discussion of, of this vocabulary because it is a long vocabulary. Uh, but uh, what you're going to have as well is a video on constitutional principles that you will need to watch. Uh, that will be available for you. Really, the only activity that we have today, uh, and uh, you saw that up on the lectern, uh, is the uh, first three articles. Uh, the first three articles of the Constitution. And what did I just say they were? It has to do with the first, the first, uh, first article, legislative, second article, the executive, the third article, the judiciary, right? Okay, so I want you to put uh, on this, you know, there are, you know, obviously you can just maybe if you want to draw with a ruler, put a, or, a, a, you know, some kind of straight edge, put a, put a line uh, so that it's three sections and you can write on that. You can also fill it out online if you want. Uh, but this, uh, this, uh, the three articles activity, I want components and I want a good amount of components for each one. Obviously, article one is probably going to have the most because it is by far the longest part of the Constitution. Uh, that article one is the largest article in the Constitution by far. Uh, and so that's going to have the, the most components. Now, do I want you to write everything down about that's listed for that article? No, but I want you to go through the article uh, a little bit, glance through it and say, oh, well, this is there. Yeah, okay, that's there. Uh, yeah, that that's there, you know, um, and jot those down. And, and, uh, and I don't want to, I don't want you to put like one down or two down. You know, obviously you can come up, especially for article one, you can come up with a laundry list of different things, uh, different components uh, for uh, in Article 1. Article 2 is the same way. Now, Article 3, on the other hand, not a lot in there. Uh, the only thing you're going to see is really that there's a Supreme Court uh, and uh, Congress will be making the other, the court system. <laughs> and that's about it. I mean, it doesn't say that there are going to be uh, five justices or nine justices or seven justices or whatever. Uh, that was decided by the Congress, uh, uh, by an act of Congress. So anyway, that's what we're looking for. Guys, uh, uh, treat, uh, uh, treat the sub well. 
I, I like to hear it when you treat the sub well. So we will uh, see you uh, on Thursday. Bye-bye.